The spectrum of the output of a system is easily obtained from the input spectrum and the frequency response of the system. So our objectives here are to relate the spectrum at the output to the spectrum at the input using the frequency response. And this leads naturally to an interpretation of systems as filters. So we'll assume that we're dealing with linear time invariant systems. In that case, we have an input x of n and an output y of n, and there are several different ways we can relate the input to the output. If we use a difference equation, then we can write the output y of n as a sum of coefficients b0, b1, through bm times past values of the input, x of n, x of n minus 1, x of n minus m. If we find the impulse response of the system, which we can do easily by applying an impulse to the system and measuring what comes out, then we can relate the input to the output using the impulse response and the process of convolution which we're writing out here is a sum over k, h of k, x of n minus k. Now a third way to relate the input to the output is using the frequency response of the system. If we apply an input complex sinusoid, e to the j, 2 pi, f hat n, then the output of the system is equal to that same complex sinusoid, but modified by h of f hat. So this is a complex number, and it's going to change the amplitude and phase of the input sinusoid. Now frequency response, combined with a spectral representation for signals, becomes very, very powerful for developing insight and understanding the behavior of systems. To see this, let's use the property of linearity and write the input to the system as a weighted sum of two complex sinusoids at different frequencies. So we'll have x of n be a times e to the j 2 pi f 1 hat n plus b e to the j 2 pi f 2 hat of n. We know how the system behaves when we apply e to the j 2 pi f 1 hat n. What we get out is h of f 1 hat e to the j 2 pi f 1 hat n. Similarly, if we apply a complex sinusoid of frequency f 2 hat, we get out a complex sinusoid of frequency f2 hat, but multiplied by the complex constant h of f2 hat. So if we apply a weighted sum of these two inputs, then the output is a weighted sum of the individual outputs. We have a times h of f1 hat times a complex sinusoid at frequency f1 hat plus b times a h of f2 hat times a complex sinusoid at f2 hat. So if I write my input as a weighted combination of complex sinusoids, my output is also a weighted combination of complex sinusoids, and the weights have been modified by the frequency response of the system at those frequencies. Let's take an example where we put an input signal cosine of 2 pi times 1 eighth n plus pi over 4 into a system, and we'll assume that the system has a behavior where the output is given as x of n plus x of n minus 2. Well, first we need to find the frequency response of this system, and we can do that by applying a complex sinusoid e to the j 2 pi f hat n as the input. That gives us an output y of n e to the j 2 pi f hat n, that's the x of n term, plus e to the j 2 pi f hat times a quantity n minus 2. That's the x of n minus 2 term in our expression for the input-output relationship of this system. Well, I can factor out terms here and rewrite y of n as the quantity 1 plus e to the minus j 4 pi f hat parentheses times e to the j 2 pi f hat n. So we put in e to the j 2 pi f hat n what we observed out is e to the j 2 pi f hat n times this parentheses, and that's what we're going to call our frequency response h of f hat. So now that we have the frequency response, we can decompose this input cosine of 2 pi 1 eighth n plus pi over 4 into complex sinusoids using the Euler representation. The x of n is 1 half e to the j pi over 4 times e to the j 2 pi 1 eighth n plus 1 half e to the minus j pi over 4 
e to the minus j 2 pi 1 8 n. So we've written our input, this cosine, as a weighted sum of two complex sinusoids at different frequencies. One's at frequency 1 8 and the other one is at frequency minus 1 8 cycles per sample. Now all we have to do at this point is apply linearity to find y of n. We know that if we put in e to the j 2 pi 1 8 n, what we're going to observe out is e to the j 2 pi 1 8 n times the frequency response evaluated at 1 8. So that gives us the first term. And then the second term we obtain by realizing that the output, when I put in a complex sinusoid of frequency negative 1 8, is going to be another complex sinusoid of frequency negative 1 8 times the frequency response evaluated at negative 1 8. Hence our output y of n is this sum of these two complex sinusoids with the constants out in front as weighting factors. Now we're going to take this example a little bit further and simplify our answer. We can factor out an e to the minus j 2 pi f hat from both terms here as well as a factor of 2 and rewrite h of f hat as 2 times e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times the quantity e to the j 2 pi f hat plus e to the minus j 2 pi f hat all over 2. And if you multiply everything back together here, you see that we haven't changed anything. h of f hat is identical to what we started with. Now the reason we've done this is because in this form, I can see that h of f hat is 2 times e to the minus j 2 pi f hat times a cosine of 2 pi f hat. So when I evaluate this, at frequency 1 8 cycles per sample, I'm going to have 2 cosine pi over 4, e to the minus j pi over 4, and since cosine of pi over 4 is the square root of 2 over 2, the result is square root of 2 times e to the minus j pi over 4, and h of minus 1 8 ends up being square root of 2 times e to the j pi over 4. So if I use these values for the frequency response in the expression that we had for y of n on the previous slide, we have 1 half e to the j pi over 4 times h of 1 eighth, which is square root of 2 e to the minus j pi over 4, times a complex sinusoid at frequency 1 eighth, plus 1 half e to the minus j pi over 4 times h of minus 1 eighth, which is square root of 2 e to the j pi over 4, times a complex sinusoid at frequency minus 1 8. Multiplying out the terms, we see that these phase factors, e to the minus j pi over 4 and e to the j pi over 4, cancel, and we're left with the square root of 2 times a cosine of 2 pi times 1 8 n. So recall our input was cosine of 2 pi 1 8 n plus pi over 4. Our output is a cosine of the same frequency. The amplitude has been changed and the phase has also been changed. So now we're ready to look at the spectrum of the output in a general form. We can write the input as a weighted sum of complex sinusoids with frequencies f hat sub k and weights x k. These x of k define the spectrum of the input. The output y of n then can be written as a sum over k of coefficients y k times e to the j 2 pi f hat k n. Recall that if we have a complex sinusoid of frequency f hat k on the input, that's going to produce a complex sinusoid of frequency f hat k at the output. So I have the same set of frequencies on the input and the output. These weights, in general, can differ. In particular, since e to the j 2 pi f hat k n, that complex sinusoid, the amplitude and phase get modified by the frequency response at f hat k we see right away that the coefficients on the output spectrum are obtained by taking the input coefficients, the x of k, multiplying them by the frequency response evaluated at frequency f hat k. So graphically, if I have a spectrum x of f hat, which consists of these different complex sinusoidal terms at frequency f hat k and coefficient x k, to find the spectrum of the output, I'm going to multiply my input spectrum by the frequency response of my filter, graphed here as h of f hat, to obtain my output spectrum. You can see that the shape of my frequency response has altered the amplitudes of the input spectrum components. 
Now it would alter the phase as well, but I'm only drawing amplitude here because I can't easily graph amplitude and phase. So for example, this term is actually amplified by the system producing this component here. This smaller component here is attenuated by the system and goes to zero. The spectrum of the output is the product of the spectrum of the input times the frequency response of the system. Now, if I was going to think about the output of the system in the time domain, in other words, in terms of the time signal x of n, then we know that the output is the convolution of the impulse response with the input. And convolution, in general, is a difficult operation to visualize. If I go into the frequency domain and look at spectra, then the spectrum of the output is just the product of the frequency response of the system times the spectrum of the input. And multiplication is very easy to visualize and very intuitive. This relationship between the frequency response of the system and the spectrum of the output leads us naturally to thinking about systems as filters. Now, in general, a filter is something that separates. And in our context here, we're going to separate signals on the basis of frequency. So these would be called frequency selective filters. Suppose I have an input spectrum, x of f hat, as sketched. Well, I could consider an ideal low pass filter to be a system that passes low frequencies and attenuates higher frequencies. And since the output spectrum is the product of the input spectrum times my frequency response, I see that this square function is going to pass these lower frequencies and zero out these higher frequencies. Therefore, the spectrum of the output consists only of the lower frequency components. Now, this is called an ideal filter because it has a sharp vertical cutoff between where the frequencies passes and the frequencies that it attenuates. In practice, real filters have a gradual transition. Similarly, if I have an ideal bandpass filter, that filter is going to pass a band of frequencies and attenuate both lower frequencies and higher frequencies. So in the example I've sketched here, this bandpass filter is passing the frequencies that include the range where these two components of the input are located, and thus the output only has those two components of the input because the other components of the input are zeroed out by this frequency response. Again, we're multiplying the spectrum of the input times the frequency response to get the output. And this is a very intuitive operation. Finally, we can think about an ideal high pass filter, which is going to pass the higher frequencies and attenuate the lower frequencies. In this case, I've shown an ideal high pass filter that allows these two frequency components of the input to pass, but it blocks these other components at lower frequencies. Viewing a system in the frequency domain where the spectrum of the output is the product of the frequency response and the spectrum of the input leads to a very intuitive and powerful characterization of systems.